listen in, but I could see kind of what was going on and it looked like it was a pretty active session. So tell us, Nancy, what was the workshop? How many people? Oh, that was the first INSR one. Yes, with Stephanie and Simone. But networks around the world. And there were yeah, 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 yeah. All from a one person one in Mexico to the European one across the continent. Fantastic. How many participants? There were close to 40, I believe, but that included all of us. And Stephanie agreed she would put it together again for the National Seed Conference. So I think that will be very good. Is that still yeah. happening? It's going to be in March, we hope. Oh. That they haven't um, snared a facility yet. Yeah. Yeah. Where do they want, where is it supposed to happen this year or DC. next year? It'll be DC. Again, DC. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was one of the best conferences I've ever gone to. The oh. one in 2017, I think, with the last time it was yeah. in DC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like yeah. South Africa very much too, though. Yeah. Oh, South Africa. <laughs> Darwin, Darwin is going to be great too. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> now, Darwin. So there's a, there'll be a magic there that you just don't get because we we are we are still in wilderness and with traditional owners and vibrant cultural linkages and yeah, it's a, it's a just a different feel. So It'll be really nice. World week. Yes. Yeah. To your country, <laughs> Stephanie. Hello. All right, we are going live. So the session is just about to, okay. We are live, all right. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. If you've been participating all day in workshops or if this is your first one, we're happy you're here. This presentation is being recorded. So you are consenting to participate in a recorded session if you stay in this room with us. The best method to engage in this session is posted in the Feedloop chat panel to the right. We are running this as a Zoom webinar, so we will ask you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of that video screen to share your questions with the presenters. You can use the public chat bar in Feedloop on the right for discussion with others in this session if you wanna say hello or introduce yourself. If you are having connectivity issues or prefer to participate in this presentation directly through Zoom, you can find a direct link using the Experiencing Issues link below the screen, um, below this video. Please remember that your participation is covered by the SER Code of Conduct and that you should uh, show, we ask you that you show respect and courtesy in your interactions with presenters and other conference delegates. Now I'll turn it over to our presenters so they can get started. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. Um, for those of you that have joined us, uh, welcome. Um, I'm Kingsley Dixon, the incoming chair of uh, the, the society um, and uh, a person heavily involved in restoration ecology. I probably know a few of you. Um, our presenter, key presenter today is uh, uh, Simone Pedrini, Simon to all of his friends. And um, for both of us, we're in Australia. It's uh, just uh, past 4 a.m. in the morning. So we're trying to put a very brave face on <laughs> and not somewhere sleeping. I'd also like to introduce Nancy Shaw and Stephanie Frischke, who are both other members of the International Network for Seed Based Restoration. We all four. Uh, sit in that network. And, and this session is very much based around uh, the activities of the International Network. And we're a key chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration. So we welcome you. If you're not a member, to become a member, it's, uh, uh, it's a pretty dynamic group of people connecting the world of seeds as we move forward. Um, an important part of all of our activities that we do in Australia, and I know we do in other parts of the world, is just to acknowledge the fact that we all meet on land that is land of traditional custodians, wherever we are around the world. And we acknowledge their leaders past, present and emerging. Um, the UN Decade of Restoration, which was officially launched last week, of course, has been an extraordinary stepping stone for us to move forward on the global restoration challenge. 
But the challenge is an extraordinary one, not simply because of the scale, 350 million hectares are growing, but also the mechanisms for technology and the toolkits that we will need to empower the world to deliver those outcomes. And a key to that is, of course, the seed supply chain. And as a number of you have uh, on this call that I, I know, um, understand the seed supply chain, have written about it, um, it's a chain that in some places is a little more robust than others, but in other areas of the world is quite uh, uh, broken and unable to deliver on those outcomes. Indeed, in places like Australia, almost 98% of all seed used in global restoration technology or in, in our uh, large-scale restoration comes from wild source seed. And uh, with the new push uh, for carbon to be part of the restoration challenge, uh, the demand for wild seed for biodiverse carbon becomes more important. Um, the National Academies of Science uh, in the US uh, just this week uh, talked about the fact that for every $1 million spent on global restoration, we generate 13 to 32 job years. So in this world that's rapidly becoming the post-COVID world, uh, that will really matter in building global economies, but in a new and green way that's more sustainable. Um, importantly, for every $1 that you invest in restoration, you get between three and four dollars fifty back in total economic, ecological, and social values. So it really makes good sense, and the foundations to that will be getting the seed supply chain correct. As part of that, the INSR realised that there was importance for a global capacity to understand seed standards. What is a good seed? What's a bad seed? And how do you know that you've purchased those? And so today's uh, presentation and workshop and Q&A session, um, and I encourage you to please uh, put questions in the chat as we're going along, um, is about understanding how standards can really build the robust seed supply chain in a way that will enable us to deliver well beyond the decade's promise of a restored world. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to uh, Simon Pedrini. Welcome, Simon. Hello, thank you, Kingsley. So I will now share my screen and start with my talk. Can you confirm that you're seeing my screen all right? Perfect. Excellent. So here we go. The title of this workshop is Making Native Seed Standards a Commercial Reality. So I would imagine most of you are already familiar with this series of documents. So these are uh, papers that were published last year on the Journal of Restoration Ecology. And through all of this paper, we tried to break down every step of the native seed supply chain. And when I talk about the native seed supply chain, I always like to present it in the context of a broader restoration project and restorative activities. But the goal is to go uh, from a degraded ecosystem to a an healthy and resilient ecosystem that has been restored correctly. Usually that happens for a restoration plan. And if seeds are needed to accomplish this plan, then you need a native seed sourcing and procurement plan. Native seed supply chain usually commence at the collection of seeds from natural population. And if needed, seeds can be multiplied in seed farm. Then seed can be processed, tested for quality, stored over time. Uh, dormancy can be broken if needed. And, uh, Seed enhancement technology can be applied. Finally, seeds can be brought back into the soil and hopefully through monitoring and adjusted management, you can achieve your restored ecosystem. This is looking at the seed supply chain from the perspective of a supplier. What I'm trying to do today is turn it around and start to look in from the point of view of a restoration practitioner. And uh, the major um, forces acting on our practitioners are trying to be on time, on budget, and delivering all of the restoration objectives. And what we're going to do in this presentation is run a series of simulation of a restoration scenario and see how improving each of the steps of the native seed supply chain would make life easier for a restoration practitioner in trying to achieve those goals on budget, on time. 
So this set, we're going to present a, a fictional restoration project. And here, I'll show you how it works. So let's say we'll establish a target of the number of plants that we need to, to, to get on the ground. Let's say a million plants divided, for example, in these three um, different genus. Um, we then, to run the simulation, we'll run an estimation of how many kilos of seeds do we need. And knowing the cost of the for the seeds per kilo, we can estimate a total cost of, of seeds required for the project. We'll then add costs for the operations, like the tractors and so on, and we'll have a total cost for the restoration project. We'll then run a simulation. And by running the simulation, we'll have in return a number of the plants successfully established. In this case, for example, uh, alpha million. That means that we've achieved 50% of our plant target, and uh, I've added here a value that uh, needs to represent the efficiency of this restoration, seed-based restoration project, which is the cost for a thousand established plant. Because at the end of the day, what matters is how many plant you get successfully established, not how many seeds you put in the ground. And I've decided to use the cost for a thousand established plant because at times the cost for a single plant is below one cent of a dollar. Um, however, just talking about the total number of plants, does it convey how each species is performing, how the diversity is coming back? So if we look in this example, you see how the success is skewed towards the grasses. I've tried to create an index to encompass for these different performance between species, and it's a numeric value that goes between zero and 100. I will call it the diversity index, even though it probably is not a correct term. So in this example, we know that our index is 38. Let's change the result of the simulation so that now just the grasses managed to establish successfully and the index now dropped to 27. If we got a more balanced success between the different species, you can see that now the index had got up to 55. So that's a bit of an explainer of how those numbers work. And I'm going to present every simulation by using exactly this template, so it'll be hopefully easier to follow all the various results. Uh, a bit of a disclaimer how the simulation work. Most of it has been based on assumptions and educated guesses. I've, for example, made up the species composition, operation cost of estimated on a few numbers, but they're not real data. And so are the variable for success rate. And also it's an oversimplified simulation. Many of the variable that affect restoration in real life, like land access, weed management, and soil preparation, were not included into the simulation, just to keep things a bit simpler. However, there are actually data underpinning uh, part of this uh, presentation, and this is mostly based on seed price, size, quality, germination. Uh, we've collected all this data from a pool of 191 species, all coming from the southwest of Western Australia. And uh, when I'll be talking about real data during this presentation, you will see in the left hand side and the left corner, uh, the real data showing up. Okay, after all this disclaimer, I can finally get into the, the talk. So in our native seed based restoration project, we decided to do it in the part, southwestern part of Australia, and especially to concentrate on an area called the wheat belt. This, no more than 150 years ago, was old bush. But over the past 150 years, most of it has been cleared uh, for agriculture. Now, less than 2% of this original vegetation is left. So let's say we've been contacted by a customer that wants to put back uh, into bush uh, this part that used to be a farmland. And let's say he wants to do it for on 2,000 hectares. It's going to be a carbon project, a biodiverse carbon project, but because we are very good practitioners, we want to follow the standards for ecological restoration. So we know how important it is to have a reference ecosystem as a target for our restoration. And if you look at the side we've selected, there's two pockets of remnant vegetation. So if they are healthy enough, we could pick those as our, our model and reference ecosystem. If they're not good enough, we can probably look around the area and see if there's something that could still be considered healthy and a good reference model. And based on this model, we've come up with this uh, um, species selection. As I said earlier, this is an oversimplified simulation and I'm just keeping eight species to keep it simple. However, I tried to select the species in order to be representative of the most common family and um, life forms. 
These are the species that we're going to work on. Uh, Eucalyptus leptopoda is a mallee or a tree. And we've got some shrubs. One is a Melaleuca navimutaceae, uh, an acacia, Archiplex, the Cunopodiaceae, a Bronia, uh, a Lotus, it's an Amarantaceae a forb. We've got Singopogon, which is a grass, and Polyphica, which is a daisy. Uh, now we've got our species composition. Next step is to determine what is our target for the restoration. How many plants do we want? Uh, our expected return is going to be five plants per square meter, which that means we're going to have 50,000 plants per hectare. And I've divided the plants in order to have about 5,000 between trees and shrubs per hectare and 45,000 of forbs, grasses, and andro, more of the understory species. If we then multiply this number by the total number of hectares, we'll get a total of 100 million plants, which is our final target. So now that we know how many plants we want, we need to understand how many seeds we need. To understand that, we first need to know how many seeds do we have per gram, or actually how big and how heavy the seeds are. Uh, there are a few ways to get this data. Some is actually to get the seeds and collect it yourself. Otherwise, you can look into various internet databases. Probably one of the most complete databases in the world has been developed by the Millennium Seed Bank. It can be found at this link. So we've obtained now this data and um, the seed size, the seed weight, can be either shown as a seed per gram or a thousand seed weight. I personally prefer to use the second one, the weight for a thousand seed, because when you've got very large seed, you might actually have uh, less than one seed per gram. So if you use the thousand seed weight, it doesn't matter how large seeds are, you can have this number presented in all, in all scenarios. Uh, here I want to show you the species we selected, how they fit within the distribution of size of various species that we've actually tested. So the 191 species that we collected data on, this is kind of the thousand seed weight distribution. And these are the species that we selected for the simulation. So you'll see that more or less tend to follow the distribution that we found across many more species. So. <clears throat> When you know how many seeds, uh, uh, how big the seeds are, we can calculate how many uh, seeds we need. So we divided the thousand seed weight by a thousand to have the weight of a single seed and then multiply for the total number of plants we expected to get. And we can get a weight in grams and kilograms. That means that altogether to complete this project, we will need 257 kilograms. It's a, roughly about 130 grams per hectare. Now that we know how many seeds do we need, the next question is, where do we get the seeds from? Do we collect them ourselves? Do we contract some collectors? Do we buy them from suppliers? Uh, well, as Kingsley said earlier, here in Australia, almost the entirety of seeds that can be bought comes from directly collected seed from the wild. So seed farming is not common here. But when it comes to direct seed collections, there's the problem that needs to be taken into consideration. So you need to maximize the genetic diversity of that population. But you have to collect enough seed without damaging the population. So you have to limit the amount of seeds that you can collect to 15% or below 10% for annual species. You do, shouldn't collect from the same population every year. And if maturation of seeds uh, is extended through the season, it's usually better to collect at different time to encapsulate more of that diversity. And these are all the reason why native seeds are so expensive. On top of that, if you've seen in our example, our remnant vegetation is pretty small. So there might not be enough seed um, to get started straight away with our restoration plan. So it might take a year before we build enough seed to be actually able to go out there and, and do our seeding. <clears throat> so now we know how to get those seeds. We found, for example, a supplier that has those seeds of appropriate origin. And this is the actual prices that we managed to get from native seed suppliers of the various pieces. And they range between $100 all the way to $10,000 per kilo on an average of about $2,000. I wanna now show you how this price compared to the prices that we collected across many more species. We managed to get them for about 150 species, but we had to remove 19 outliers because they were way too expensive and they didn't work well with our statistic. So on average, the cost of a batch of kilo of native seeds here in Western Australia is about $1,000. 
is how the cost is distributed among different life forms. And this is where our species sits within that distribution. If we exclude Bronia simosa, they sit all the way up there at $10,000 a kilo, we'll see that now our average is about $850 and is not too different for we, what is the average price of seeds. So we know that for the simulation, we're using the price that is more or less in line with what we've observed in the seed market. Now that we know the cost of seeds per kilo and how many seeds we need, we can calculate the total cost, which is about $188,000. Next step to consider is seeding. How are we going to deliver these seeds? Um, the most common approach used over here is seed broadcasting. It can be done manually or mechanically. Given the scope and the scale of this project, probably using a tractor is wiser. Uh, we can now calculate the cost of the seed operation cost, the seeding operation cost. Let's estimate the cost of a tractor and the broadcaster, including the fuel, the driver, and support on ground. It's about $200 an hour. Average speed is about five uh, hectares an hour. That means that working 10 hours a day, uh, you can get done 50 hectares a day so that the project can be completed in 40 days. And that brings up the total cost of the operation at about $80,000. Now we can finally run our first simulation. The cost of seed is known, we know the cost of the operations, and the total is about $268,000. And we can finally run our first simulation. The first result is 1.6 million plants established, which is 1.6 of the total amount of plants that we wanted. If we look at the cost for a thousand established plant, it's about $160. And our diversity index is below 1%. So it wasn't necessarily very expensive, the results were pretty terrible. So we probably need to change something in our simulation if you want to get closer to our target. To understand what's happening, it's probably better to take a closer look to what's happening to the seed in the ground. Our goal is to get five plants per square meter. And in our first simulation, we've assumed a 100% success rate, meaning that every seed we put into the ground is expected to return into a, a, a successfully established plant. That means that we're gonna put five seeds per square meter. But unfortunately, in real life, there's many variables uh, that are going against the fact that seeds will be successfully established. For example, seed removal, predation, temperature, drought, so water availability, various stress, predation, competition, and so on. So we need to start asking ourselves various questions on the different life stages of the seed. First of all, how many seeds are able to reach a proper microsite? Because we're using seed broadcasting, we can assume that maybe one out of five seeds is able to reach a proper site. How many seeds will germinate? Let's say 80%. And if you can say how many seeds are able to emerge, that is actually going to drop the percentage of it. Because a series of studies uh, in the States, but also in Australia, has proven that the major bottleneck in seed rec seedling recruitment is actually the major phase. So let's say about 40%. How many of those seeds that emerge will be able to survive? We'll estimate it at about 50%. That means if we want to have five plants per square meter, we'll probably need to do something about 150 seeds per square meter. Is 30 times more seeds than what we've initially put in in our first simulation. For the second simulation, we just buy 30 times more seed and see how it go. So we'll need now all of a sudden what we need to pay is more than five and a half million dollars. If we add to it the operation cost and run the simulation, we see that we're doing better than before. We now reach almost 50 million plants, 50 percent of the target. And the cost for a thousand established plants have dropped to $115. The diversity index is up to 23. However, as you can see, the cost of almost $6 million to run a restoration project on 2,000 hectares is a bit prohibitive. So we want to look for alternative way to make it more efficient. So far, we've been talking about seed broadcasting. It's a fairly quick system, but has got some limitation. One of his limitations is imprecise delivery that can lead to under or over seeding. And the other one is surface seeding. Seeds are placed on the surface. That means they are more subjected to predation, removal from wind and water, higher surface temperature and desiccation of the seedlings. 
ultimately leading to massive seed wastage. Alternative method to try to compensate for these issues is using precision, precision seeding. With these methods, you can control sowing depth and spatial distribution a bit better. Uh, you can control sowing rate and it's got a fairly good uh, speed of delivery. If we now look at the demographic of the seedling recruitment uh, with precision seeding, we can now assume that four out of five seeds are able to reach the microsite. And keeping all the other variables the same, it means that what we need is about 40 seeds per square meter, which is eight times more than our, our first simulation. Uh, However, we'll be using different equipment. So let's assume that the cost for the seeder and the tractor is gonna be the same. However, the speed of delivery is lower than uh, the broadcaster. So it would be at about two hectares an hour, meaning that we can complete 20 hectares a day and that can bring us to complete the project in about a hundred days for a total cost of $200,000. Uh, if we now run the simulation, uh, adjusting the price of seeds for the multiplied by 30, instead of spending $6 million, we're now spending $1.5 million. Adding the cost of operation and then running the simulation, we've got a similar result. So it's about 50 million plants or 50%. Now the cost for a thousand established plants dropped drastically to $32, but our diversity index is still similar at about 25. Now let's have a closer look of how each of the species is doing and why, even though we're spending lots of money and put lots of seed up, we're still just half the way to reaching our target. So this is the total number of plants that we've got. Some are doing fairly well, some are terribly underperforming. And that might raise the questions, are we sure that the seed that we've bought or collected are actually alive? To do so, we'll need to perform some seed quality test. The first seed quality test is called a purity test. Uh, it's done by collecting a representative sample from our seed batch. And, um, and then from this representative sample, we divide what appears to be a pure seed unit and what is non-seed like twigs, rocks, leaves, and other material. We'll get a weight for these two fractions and a percentage of the weight. In this example, we got 90% of this our batch that can be considered a pure seed unit. While we've got these seeds, we can also use these seeds to calculate the weight for a thousand pure seed unit. In this example, it's five grams. Uh, this uh, short video, uh, it's an example of what we do in our lab here in Australia. So this is a batch of seed that we bought from a supplier. It's an eucalyptus. So we collect a, a small sample uh, from this batch. We have to mix it thoroughly to make sure that the sample is representative of the bag. This example, this sample was actually too small. We needed a larger one. But you can see that out of all those uh, material that we picked out of it, just six of, like just 5% um, of that is actually pure seed unit. All the rest is in a material, empty seeds or ovuloids. Um, this is a particularly poor batch, but it's not uncommon for mutacea, like the eucalyptus, for example, to have very low um, seed purity. So once we've got our pure seed unit determined, we can now get the seeds and run a viability test to understand how many seeds that appear to be healthy, that, 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 that look like seeds, are actually healthy and potentially able to germinate. In this example, we've got 80% of the seeds that we consider to be filled and able to germinate. We can then multiply the pure seed unit by the viable seed unit, and we can get an estimate of what is the viability of the entire seed batch. In this example, 72%. So if, for example, if we had a 10 kilo bag of seed, we know that 7.2 of those seeds can be considered viable. Uh, there's various ways to assess uh, viability. One is a cut test to take seed cut and check the health of the embryo. Uh, another one would be using tetrazolium. The methods that we are working on and we found to be good is using an X-ray scanner. Looking at this X-ray, you can see through the seeds and we can determine what looks filled and healthy and what has been predated, shriveled, underdeveloped or empty. 
But this short video shows how we run this operation. Usually we do it on five samples of 50 seeds each. We collect the x-ray image and we've got software that we can use to mark uh, what are the seeds that we consider healthy and field and what are not. Um, if you look at the result, and now we look at the results about seed quality and viability throughout all of the species that we're using in this example, we see the flux rate between 10% and 77%, an average of 22%. If we now compare this data to what was the, the average across various species, we see that we've been particularly unlucky with this uh, batch of seeds because our average is 22%. What on average across other species is about 56%. If you look at our species distribution, some of them fall within the range of that life form, but some example, like for example, Ashup, Camnicola for the shrubs, or the Melaleuca and Eucalyptus for the tree, their viability is quite low compared to other species in that group. So now that we know what the pure life seed is, we'll need to adjust the amount of seeds to compensate for the lack of viability. We do that by multi dividing 100 by the pure life seed, and it gives us this adjustment rate that goes between an increase in seeds that we need from 30% to a tenfold in Archiplex and Nicola. Now that we adjusted the quantity of seed and the price accordingly, we are going to spend $3 million to buy the seed. We also have to consider that seed testing is not free. We have to pay someone to do testing for us. And the cost here in Australia is about between one and $200 per seed batch. However, we are working on developing um, software, an algorithm is capable to speed up the process of seed testing. This is an example of our better version of the software. So we can insert the image from the X-ray. We can start doing some image analysis and modify the parameters of the image so that we can run a seed detection algorithm to understand what is a seed, what is not. And then we can calculate the seed property automatically. So they'll give us a total number of seed. And also by adjusting the color threshold, we'll be able to determine how many seeds are viable and how many seeds are not viable. That means that it can take the entire process from a 20 minutes, half an hour process down to less than two minutes if it's already programmed. It's still a work in progress. We still try to implement new features and make it more reliable, but the progress so far has been fairly good and it's nice to see this happening. And hopefully someday it'll be a tool available for most people around the world to use to test the seed quality. That said, with such a tool working and working effectively, it'll be possible to drop the cost of the seed testing from $200 a batch down to $20 a batch. Uh, in our example, I'll save us just a couple of thousand dollars, which is not a big deal given how much we're spending. But this is an oversimplified simulation. In a real life scenario, you're probably dealing with 50 or even hundreds of species. And more often than not, they don't come all from the same seed batch. They might come from different years or different collection. That means that you might have to deal with hundreds of different seed batches. And dropping by 10 times the cost of the um, of seed testing, I might actually make a big difference on your budget. Let's run the simulation, having now these numbers and the total cost of about $2.2 million. And, the plant, and now we've got the results of plants successfully established about 88%. The cost of a thousand plant has now gone up a bit to $37. Uh, our diversity index has now gone almost up to 50. So overall, this is not bad. We want to do better. We want to get the diversity right and we want to get the target right. So let's look again how each species is doing. We can see how many plants we got successfully established. And because we know now how many pure life seeds we've used for each of these species, we can also understand what is the success rate for each of those species. So in this range between 0% for Baronia to 16% for the eucalyptus. And on average, we got about 8% of success rate. Uh, if we look especially at these uh, four species, we see the success rate is pretty terrible, going from zero to 5%. So this might raise a question. Are we sure that those seeds that look like they are alive, the pure life seeds, are actually germinating or they're able to germinate? And this brings me to the next topic and the next um, part of the supply chain, which is seed dormancy and seed dormancy alleviation. The seed dormancy 
uh, it, we consider this inability of a seed to germinate when it's got all the appropriate condition to do so. So in terms of moisture, temperature, light, and whatever, it should be able to germinate, yet still it doesn't do it. It's very common in Australian species, but not just here. Uh, this trait of dormancy is found, uh, especially in very extreme environments, and is very prevalent for small and understory species. Dormancy is usually classified in five major groups. Before we can consider and think how we can break this dormancy, it's important to cl clearly understand what dormancy type our species have. There's a series of steps that can be done to understand what's the dormancy type we've, we're dealing with. First one is germ germination test, and the duration of germination matters, a water permeability test, in an embryo size and structure. So if you look at germination tests, we see that few species germinate within 28 days, while other much slower or don't germinate at all. When we look, people are able to imbibe. One of them, Acacia cuminata, we see that is not able to imbibe water. If you look at embryo type, they all got different kinds of embryos, but they're all fairly large and developed. So when we start looking at dormancy type, we can now exclude three of the species from being dormant. So the Melaleuca, the Eucalyptus, and the Asteraceae, we know they're not dormant, while the other ones have got different types of dormancy. For example, Acacia, because we know it cannot imbibe water, is probably going to have a, a physical dormancy. While for these other four species, um, because they can imbibe water, because they've got a large embryo and still they cannot germinate readily, it means that they probably have a physiological dormancy. Let's now look how this dormancy can be treated. Uh, for physical dormant seed, that means they're not able to imbibe water, uh, odd water sterification is a method commonly used to break this dormancy. Uh, and it works for most of the physiological dormant species. In our case, exposing our seed to two minutes of odd water allowed to increase germination for 3% all the way to 72%. However, this method does not apply to all species with physical dormancy. Sometimes using hot water might kill the seed, or sometimes it's not enough and you might need to use sulfuric acid, for example. So it's important to do the testing before you apply any method. The physiological dormant seeds, uh, there's ways to break this dormancy, and it's usually related to the fact that um, those seeds come within external structure, like flores or pericarps. So usually by removing mechanically these structures, is it possible to increase germination of seeds? We can do it experimentally by just rubbing the seed and extracting from the structures. By doing so, we can see that now we can drastically improve the success across these three species, Artriplex, Singapogon, Eptilotus. However, there's one species missing, which is Baronia, which was the one that was at 0%. Baronia is considered to be part of those intractable dormant species. Uh, they are very common here in Australia, it's about 30% of our species, and they belong to a broad range of families. The one we're considering here is a rutaceae. It's very hard to work on them, and so far, one of our collaborators and student, Michael Just, has been working on it for years, and he managed to get the germination up to 15% by having a series of uh, treatments with after ripening, exposure to smoke and heat, you can get it up to 15%. So to sum it up, we know that um, we see what the germination was before and what is after the treatments. And now if you see the average among all the species, before we had an average of 50% germination, now after the treatments, we can get it up to 50%, to 81%. And that's great on an experimental level, but now we need to scale up these processes uh, across all the seed batches and so on hundreds of kilos of times. And to do so, we need seed processing. There's different kinds of seed processing. It's not all of them are meant to break dormancy. Some of them are used to increase the purity of the seed lot. And this, for example, is seed sorting that can be done through sieving. It's done by separating smaller, larger fraction than a knot seed uh, from a batch. And then once you've got this part, it can be further clean using an air separator they use differential density between seeds and non-seed material to clean this even further. In this little video, I'll show you what we're doing in the lab when we're performing small scale seed cleaning. So we stack two seed, we know exactly what the size of uh, the seeds is, so we know we try to see 
in, in between. We'll remove the larger components. We'll keep on shaking out seeds so we can remove all the smaller components that are not seed. <coughs> and what we're left with is like this middle fraction which contains seeds and other material. Is that when we jump onto the um, separation for density using air separation, which is by the way, not the only machine. Gravity table works just as well. So here, for example, you see how it works. There's a flow of air from underneath. They start moving the seeds in the column and all the lighter fraction is eventually gonna end up to the top while the heavier seed are gonna sit to the bottom. Or you can do the opposite. If you've got little rocks, you can actually push your seed up to the top and leave the heavier portions at the bottom. So this is an example out of 100 grams of seed that we bought. It turns out we just have something like five grams of pure seed, which we know already because we had the purity test to prove it. But now that's, that's what, we pay, what we pay for. So $300 for five grams of seed. <clears throat> example you've just seen is on a lab base and it's impossible to run hundreds of kilos uh, with that technique. Fortunately, there's lots of equipment that's been developed for agricultural seed that we can employ on natives. Sometimes it might require a bit of customization, but it allows for a much faster processing. Time. This, for example, is a picture I've taken in Germany a few years ago. Uh, and this is a, uh, an entire structure to do processing and extractions of grass seeds uh, in Southern Germany, and it's for native seeds. <clears throat> but the sorting itself won't be able to clean the seeds, for example, the archiplex of all the seeds that add those florets and pericarps that need to be removed. As we said earlier, we can use like uh, rubber mats and gloves, or we can use a seed pressure to extract these seeds. This example, this video example, we show how these seeds can be put through a pressure. So this is a, an archiplex, a solvable species of the Canopus family. And there's two rubber blades inside the treasure that rotates um, very rapidly and they are able to crack open the, the, the pericarp or the floret and therefore extract the seeds from it with some lighter material. I can then run it through an air separator as I've done earlier with sorting and then by going through seeding is that possible to get an almost perfectly keen batch of seed in a matter of a few minutes. You can see here how much material of that original batch were, was used. So remember, we started with 150 grams and we're left at the end with 18 grams of pure seed. Another method that we try to develop is using uh, acid digestion. You can see in the short video, we're using just a tiny bit of acid on about half a liter of seeds. And within a minute or so, we're able to drastically reduce the volume of uh, the seeds. But the reason why acid is effective is because it allows to weaken the structure of the pericarp or the florets and allow for an easier and more gentle extraction of the seed. We've actually tested this across all of our species and uh, I wanna show you the results of the experiment. So for uh, Atriplex and Nicola, uh, we've tried all these treatments and the threshing and the um, the acid and rubber works both pretty well at about 90% germination. Uh, because they all work well, there's no need to add the process of acid. So with threshing, we know we can extract the seed effectively. We got similar results for pylotus, and we go all the way up to 78 or 85% success rate. However, when we do the threshing alone, we see that most of the seeds actually are not extracted completely from the pericarp. And sometimes some seeds are almost damaged. So by exposing seeds for, for a couple of minutes to axis, weaken the structures and allow us to extract the seed more effectively without damaging the seed. So we recommend to use acid and threshing. Well, for this species, single pogon, the grass, we found out that using acid even for just a couple of minutes was enough to completely clean, clean the seed. So we won't recommend acid, just use threshing straight away. There was a bit of a surprise to me because I've done my PhD using uh, sulfuric acid on other grass species and they work very well. So just because this technology work on one species of a specific family or group, we should never assume they're able to work on all those species. And we always need to do testing to understand how it actually behaves. So now that we know um, what treatments we need to do, 
we need to estimate a cost for these treatments. These are the costs they are estimated per kilo, and this is the total number of kilos we've got. So we have a total cost for processing all these seeds of about $124,000, which is more or less 4% total of the seed cost. But some of you might argue, why do you need to clean all these seeds? I understand the one with dormancy. The ones, for example, the eucalyptus and the leuca that don't have dormancy. Why do you want to clean them? What's the point? And that brings me to the next step of the seed storage. Seed storage is a very important step of the supply chain and mostly overlooked, especially here in Australia. It's, um, it's important before we store seed, understand if this seed can be stored. And so they are described as orthodox seed. That means they can be um, dehydrated, they can be dried without losing their viability. Luckily, all the species in our examples uh, have been uh, can be stored and can be dried without losing viability. I want to show you this graph from some study performed in Europe, of some European species, that shows that storage conditions are vital for the longevity of the, of the seeds in the long run. So by keeping them at controlled humidity, about 15% of age, by this sort of longevity, compared when we store the seed at ambient humidity, or about 15% of age, and that's regardless of the temperature because in the second example, we're doing at zero degrees. So you'll see that over two years, um, the viability can drop by half if you're not storing the seeds in a proper and dry environment. If we now look back at our example, people might ask, but is it worth building uh, or renting such a unit to store seeds because running the operation and having the dehumidifier, it's all expensive. So let's build a little business case here. We have got about $3 million worth of seeds in our storage. And if we didn't do it properly, it means that over two years, we might lose up to 50% of its viability, meaning that we lose $1.5 million in two years. That means about roughly $2,000 a day gone in loss of viability. So yeah, it's a pretty strong case for why it's important to have a proper storage conditions. That brings me back to the argument of um, seed processing. Why is that important? And I want to show this extreme example of Atriplex amnicola. We have to look at the density of the clay unclean seeds is about 0.2 kilo per liter compared to 0.7 once they're clean. Also, the total weight of a batch before it's clean is about 650 kilos compared to 25 for exactly the same number of pure live seed. And if we now look at the volume, for the unclean seed, still for the same number of pillar seed, it's gonna be about 3,000 liters compared to 35 liters for the clean seeds. It means that the first one is gonna fill entirely all space in this car. The second one can be stored in a backpack. And when we think about storage unit and the cost for every square meters of that storage unit, that will make a big difference in the cost of our operation if we can manage to compact those seeds to a small size. And that's just one example, but I can show you across the various species that we've been using. This is the volume reduction that you can achieve with appropriate cleaning and processing. However, it's important, as I said earlier, to understand the storage behavior of these species. Not all species are orthodox, and we've got an example here in Perth in Western Australia with this plant. It's called the Macrosamia, it's an emblematic species here, and produced this very large fruit that contains this seed tree switching the shell. That's what it looks like when it's cleaned. If we look at those seeds the first year we collect them, that's what they look like exposed to the x-ray. After one year of storage, it's what they look like and that's what they are after two years. And those are clearly traits of a recalcitrant uh, seed. So it dries and then it cracks. That means that these seeds cannot be stored effectively. So we are recommending people don't put them in your seed storage room, collect them just when you need to use them. So to go back to the seed processing and, and, and to our simulation, we now know the cost of the seed processing and we're gonna add that cost to the cost of the seed. So now we've got the cost of a seed operation cost for a total of about $3.4 million. Let's run the simulation and we did it. We reached our target. We actually overachieved our target. We're now up to 110 million plants, 110% of the total. Cost of plant still about or around the $30 mark, and their success uh, diversity index is about 75, which is very good. However, 
we don't want to overachieve. We want to try to get the right number of, of plants we need. Let's have a look again of how each species is doing and now we can adjust the number of seeds to try to achieve those goals. We see some of them are overachieving while others are not doing very well. As I told earlier, we know the pure life seed used and we know the success rate. And we can see already that one of them is doing pretty bad is the Peronia simosa, which comes to no surprise because we know how complex this dormancy is and how little we can improve it. And if we look now at what is the cost for a thousand plant for each species, usually all range between five to fifty dollars. Apart from Boronia, there's all the way up there to seven hundred dollars for a thousand plant. So at this stage, instead of keep on throwing seeds out there and wasting money on seeds and hoping for the best, it might be worth to change our plant target for the species and maybe reducing the total amount of Boronia we're going to use and maybe put those species towards like uh, those, those numbers towards other species of the shrubs and trees. Um, so instead of keeping wasting money in seeds, they're eventually gonna die. We might as well use them to invest more in research to understand how to break the dormancy or instead buy green stock and plants to put in a restoration. With this information now available, we can adjust the total number of seeds we need to buy and run the simulation again. So now the cost is going to be about three millions, add in the operation cost, run the simulation. And we finally did it. We achieved 100%. The plant has gone up to about 33%. Our diversity index is not perfect at 100. So we have achieved our goal. We finally made it. We can do our restoration project perfectly. And everything we'll be doing from now on on the supply chain is going to be to decrease the cost and increase the efficiency of the project. At this stage, I want to open a parenthesis because so far we've been talking about the uh, cost of seeds by the kilo. However, I, I can see here in Australia, but not just here, is that if a seed buyer, if a seed user is just interested in the seed price per kilo, there's no incentive for the supplier to test for quality or to store seed properly or to even clean and process the seed. And that's all to do to the fact that we keep on talking of uh, price per kilo or grams. And this information doesn't convey anything about the size of seed or the quality of the seed. And I'd like to remind you that the final outcome of a seed-based restoration project is not the amount of seeds we put into the ground, but a number of plant successfully established maybe got at the end of it. So instead of using a um, dollar per kilo, we recommend to start moving towards this approach of using the cost for a thousand pure life seed. It's a way more transparent way to communicate the quality and the price of seeds. It's fairly easy calculated once you've got information about seed quality. For example, we know what is a thousand pure seed unit weight and we know the viability percentage. That means that we now understand what is the the weight of a thousand pure life seed, in our example, about uh, seven grams. And because we know the price of those seeds, by multiplying the price of the seed converted by gram to the, the thousand pure life seed weight, we can obtain this value for the cost of a thousand pure life seed, which is about seven or five dollars in this example. We've tried to run this analysis across all the 130 species that we analyzed and we got a price for, and we see that on average, the cost for a thousand pure life seed is about $6.5 and ranges, it's got different range across different growth type. And you can see that our species, as we seen earlier, tend to fit this distribution pretty well. So if we now look how each species is doing, uh, we see that our total success rate is about 14%. So we want to do something to try to improve the success rate. And we can try to do it by changing the way we're delivering seed. So far, we've been focusing on this small scale uh, two row seeder. But sometimes to improve efficiency, we'll need to scale up the process and speed up the process of restoration. For example, by adopting agricultural equipment like this canola seeder. Um, however, it's impossible right now to do it because you see how diverse and complex the morphology of these seeds is, and these seeds won't be able to go through those agricultural equipment. If we, even after we've done the processing, you see that all the seeds now become smaller than they used to be before we clean them. Our goal is to get those seeds more or less the side of the seed of a canola to go through that equipment. 
So it means that we have to take all the seed, the Dunsmuller and the Canola seed, and bring them to have more or less the side of our target seed, which is more or less, you can see in this picture, uh, what is supposed to be. So we have to take all the species and bring them to the same size class uh, of our canola seed. And that can be achieved with seed enhancement technology, specifically the technology called seed coating. There's different kind of seed coating. Um, one is called film coating, when you add a very thin uh, layer of material on the seed. Crusting, when you bulk it up a bit more, but you can still tell the shape of the seed. And then you've got the pelleting, when you reach more or less a, a novel a spherical shape and the original shape of the seed is no longer evident. There's various reasons why it is performed in the agricultural industry. And one of these is to modify and standardize the weight and the size to allow for a better logistic and a better uh, delivery to size. Technology we'll be using here for this example is seed pelleting. It's different equipment and machine that can be used for seed pelleting. The one I personally prefer, especially on small seeds, is called a rotating pan. This little video shows an example of how I performed it in the lab. It's a process of mixing powdery material with a binder, a liquid glue that tends to agglomerate this material together. And we can see when I started with this uh, sample of salt bush, we build it up from a much smaller seed to something that now is comparable to a canola, for example. This is another example on the Melaleucas seeds, and this is the difference you can see in volume for 2000 pure life seed. We've tested germination across many species, and we found that usually this pelleting technique is not detrimental towards germination. So that means that we can go ahead and calculate how much it will cost to get the pelleting done. We estimate a cost per kilo of pure life seed and multiply by numbers of kilos, and we get a total of $180,000, which is more or less 5% of the total cost of seed. We can now estimate what is the cost for the operation. So we need to get rid of our small tractor and get a much bigger one with a much bigger seeder. We have an estimated cost of about $300 an hour. But the delivery speed, because of the scale, is much faster. We can go at about 10 hectares an hour, and finish our entire operation in 20 days, meaning that our total cost would be about $60,000. We can now add the cost for the pelleting and then run the simulation with the adjusted cost for operation. We've got a total of about $3.3 million. And when we run the results, we are overachieving again at about 112%. Um, so let's adjust the species number reduce the species number so we can get 100% and then brings the cost down to $2 million. Add them all up, we still build $3 million. Success rate now is 100. Our cost for a thousand established plant is now about $30. So we dropped it a bit. That is not that drastic, the difference. Uh, but there's another reason why it's important maybe to try to adopt this technique. And it's something that we actually observed last year when we've done an experimental trial here in Western Australia. So I was asked to pellet um, seven small seeded species of eucalyptus and Melaleuca. I've done the whole step of seed quality testing, processing and pelleting in the seeds from this to this, to this. Um, then we wanted to test seedling emergence and survival in the field. We use a mechanical and manual seeding. Uh, I wanted to compare like to like, so I've used the information I was given about the seeding density, and I calculated that on average, they were delivering about half a million seeds per hectare. So I adjusted my density for the pellets to reach a similar density, and then we went to site, this remote area of Western Australia. We've done some seed trials for each species uh, ma doing manual seeding. And then we've done over a few hectares using a uh, uh, precision seeder. We then came back after a few months to find out almost all our seedlings were dead. Out of 7,000 pure seed we put in the ground, just eight seedlings survived. A similar result was seen for the mechanical seeding. Luckily, we've put in place uh, this data logger that recorded temperature and soil water content at different um, depth. And if you look especially at the soil moisture content between September and October, we'll see that there's been almost no rain event and the soil, especially close to the surface, was bone dry for almost two months. But if you look deeper, about 10 and 20 centimeters, 
you see there was still water available throughout this drought period, meaning that the seedlings, the seed out seedling died because they were probably not able to reach that subsoil moisture and they were trapped in the area where there's just not enough water for them to survive. We got a proof of that by comparing our July seeding to what was seeded earlier in June. And if you look through that field, we can see there is lots of eucalyptus, melaleuca, and acacias coming up, meaning that probably because they were sown earlier, they had more time to develop the root and to deep dig enough to reach their subsoil moisture and survive the drought. That means there's still a very important lesson that timing is essential. And the earlier you can go in the season, the lower the risk to have these uh, drastic failures. If you look our example that we had before using a precision seeder but small scale, that means that to cover 2,000 hectares, we need to push our seeding all the way late into winter in July and August. I like to remind you that in Australia, winter, it's uh, from uh, June to August, which is opposite from the Northern Hemisphere. If we look instead of using a larger canola seeder, it means that we now concentrate most of our seeding in 20 days, meaning that we're staying clear from the dangerous zone of droughts uh, later in the season. So far, I've been discussing about seed pelleting for improving mechanical properties of seed. Seed pelleting, however, is used and can be used also to deliver and target beneficial compounds such as protectants, nutrients, uh, soil adjuvants, and so on. If you look at how each species is doing and compare it to the pure seed used, we now see that our the chances of success is about uh, 14%. We can improve that uh, if we go back and look at our <clears throat> demographic process. We are now doing pretty well in terms of reaching microsite and germination, with probably room for improvement in seedling emergence and plant survival. And that can be done actually delivering some active ingredients to the pellet. For example, by acting protectants or hydrogels, surfactant agents, might be possible to increase the emergence, for example, from 40 to 50%. By adding other compounds, for example, salicylic acid, which is the natural origin of aspirin, we could probably even improve the survival of plants by 10% up to 60%. And this is actually something that we recently published, I think it was published just last week, where we described that a salicylic acid delivered through a seed coating uh, to native grass seeds can improve the survival of plants one year after seeding between five and 10%. So with that information in mind, uh, we can now try to understand what the cost um, it would be of adjusted number for seeds adjusting for the success rate. And we're gonna spend about $2 million to buy those seeds. Operation cost, total cost is still less than $2 million. Success rate is still 100%. Now the cost for a thousand established plant has dropped to $20. If you look now at how each species is doing, because we adjusted and we improved the success rate using adjuvants, we now see the success is up to 20%. And you just start to scratch the surface of this technology. There's so much more that in the future can be tested to improve uh, the success with adjuvants delivered through seed coating. We can instead start to evaluate more germination promoters or maybe try to incorporate in the pellets the beneficial microbes that can improve soil health, plant health, and plant survival. Now I want to take a different approach, a different way to see how we can save money in our restoration project. And a way is actually to look at the cost of seeds. Right now, as you can tell here, our seeds are all pretty expensive, and that's because they all have collected from the wild. But for some of the species in the example, for example, forbs, grasses, and annual, it won't be too hard probably to put them into a cultivated production system and drop the cost of those seeds. As, you, as we put them in seed farming, you can control irrigation, control fertilization, you can have mechanical harvesting, scale up the process, increase the quality of seed, the quantity of seeds available, and drastically decrease the price because you're not starting using economy of scales <coughs> to make this uh, material way more affordable. So let's say, for example, because we start using seed farming, we can now halve the cost for these three species, for example, going from $320 to $160 a kilo. You see now the drop, the prices drop drastically down to $1.2 million. So if you run the total cost and the simulation again, 
we see that the total cost for a thousand established plant is now thirteen dollars. So this was the last of the simulation. To wrap it all up, and I want to show you how, working on the various steps of the supply chain, we are going to change the total cost and the success of um, the project. In the first example, by just using seed broadcasting, we didn't spend much at all. $260,000, but the success rate was very low. If we try to adjust the quantity of seeds multiplied by 30, all of a sudden we're off the chart spending almost $6 million just to reach 50% of the success. By doing precision seeding, we got similar success, but now the cost has dropped down to $1.7 million. Some quality adjustment allowed to reach a much higher success at about 88%, but the cost also rises to about $3.2 million. In the Thomas alleviation and the processing, the cost rises a bit of about $200,000, but we can now reach our success. We're actually overachieving our success. So if you adjust the species number for, to get 100% success, it means that now we can get the cost down to $3.2 million. From now on, to get an example of and canola cedar, we can reduce the total cost down to $2.9 million. And then starting doing pelletine with beneficial compounds, it'll drop the price to below $2 million. And by employing large scale seed farming, we can drop them down to $1.2 million. Even now I look at other, other variables that we consider our results is the efficiency in terms of cost per 1,000 plant and our diversity index. You know, in the first example, the cost per 1,000 plant was more than $160, while the diversity index was below 1%. So just the number of species, the cross drop to 115, and the index rises to 23. We still got a similar index when we used precision seeding, but the cost now has dropped drastically to $32 per 1,000 seed plant. Quality adjustment will improve the diversity index almost to 50%, but we also increase likely the price for 1,000 plants. When we do dormancy and processing, it goes up to 75, the index, with a price still being around $30 and we can reach 100 of the diversity index when we adjust for the species. By doing pelleting and canola cedar, we can drop the price now to $30 per 1,000 plant. If we add adjuvants, it can go down to $20, and we can start doing seed production. The price goes down to $13 for 1,000 established plants. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, series of simulation in this example. If you want to learn more about this topic in the seed supply chain, uh, you're more than welcome to go and check it online on this special issue of journal restoration ecology it is open source and freely available to everybody to look at. If you're interested in how things are going in Australia on the native seed supply chain, this um, a report on the native seed supply chain in Australia that has been published last year and it's got lots of useful information. Or if you're in America, another very good document to have a look at is the national uh, seed strategy. That terminates uh, my talk. I'd like to thank all the people that helped me in the lab this past year and they make this uh, workshop possible. And uh, I'll pass it back to Kingsley to take some questions and to chair the panel discussion. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Um, very, very rich presentation. And uh, certainly um, for those members um, and participants, what we've actually done uh, with Simon's presentation is step through all of the key parts of um, the uh, International Seed Standards document um, from quality and how you test for quality all the way through to encouraging pelleting and uh, appropriate storage systems. So um, uh, at this stage, um, by way of introduction, and um, I wanted to ask the uh, two other INSR members, um, Nancy Shaw and Stephanie, um, starting with Nancy, if they'd like to um, present themselves and uh, a bit of their background in seed so people can get an idea of the diversity of landscapes we're talking about. Thank you. Um, Nancy Shaw, I'm a research scientist emeritus with the Rocky Mountain Research Station of the Forest Service in Boise, Idaho, here in the U.S., um, my work prior to retirement was as team leader for the Great Basin Native Plant Project. This was a large group of people 
working on all aspects of the seed supply chain and our main emphases were on seed sourcing, both for current and projected climatic conditions in the Great Basin. Uh, we also worked on bringing more, <coughs> especially wildflower species into production, learning how to do collection and seed production in agricultural seed fields for these species. And the third area was developing better seed strategies for wildlands. Our, our main problem here is post fire restoration. We lose many of our species after repeated fires from the seed bank. So we have to apply seed in our, as we're restoring these areas. And <clears throat> excuse me, some of our main problems here continuing, and fortunately we're making progress on some of them are getting better uniformity in seed testing. We do a lot of TZ testing and there's a lot of variation amongst our laboratories. So part of the problem is a lack of experience with these species and um, just different techniques being used in different labs. We need more training so that people are on the same page there. And this is really important because prices are set on the basis of viability and also seeding rates. Another area is seed storage and we do have more facilities now uh, there's a need for more monitoring of humidity during storage and changes in viability. We have some species that are quite sensitive and we can lose viability of valuable seed in a hurry. One thing here is cleaning seed up because debris left with the seed lot um, can hold moisture and reduce, well, result in reduced viability over time. Then a third area is seeding strategies on rangelands. We're trying to increase the number of species being sown. A lot of our previous seedings were for forage production for livestock. So now we're trying to incorporate multiple species of different growth types. So this means seeds of different types um, with different seeding requirements. We're not seeding enhancement that Simone has been discussing. It's just getting started here. So we're still dealing with seeds as seeds. So we have to look at seeding depths for seeds of different sizes and also competition amongst the different seeds of different growth types. So how can we separate grasses, rapid growing grasses from the more slow growing forbs and shrubs and so on. So we're doing better in all these areas. I think a big problem in our seed supply is just communication with the growers and encouraging growers to grow this native species that we need. I think a lot more can be done here. I always say research is really easy. Getting the market to run properly has been a really tough challenge for us. Um, our National Academy of Sciences Committee is looking at this right now and we will have a report out in September with recommendations for dealing with this pro project. So that's more or less where we are. Right, yeah. Uh, Nancy, just a, a quick question. Um, do you sense that the seed industry is receptive to changing their thinking? Um, things such as improving quality standards and diversity, and encouraging to grow more species. Or well, I, think, is, I think everybody's, there... uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, I think if they know they have a market, they will grow what we want. There's been a lot of uncertainty because of different interests and demands from users and um, and of course, our fires are a big problem because we have fires in some years and some years we don't have very many fires and they're in different places. So we, it's difficult to, for them to know what to plant. We can, we do have tools though for making better plans because we can look at our history of where we've been seeding, how many acres burn in which of our seed zones and how many acres we've seeded in those. We also have risk models for fires. And I think if we do a better job of planning, thinking, Here's what we normally use, and we can let the growers know that it would help a lot. And I think we're headed that way too. So there's more that can be done. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, coming from a very mixed background, um, including your European experience. Welcome. 
Thanks. Thanks, Gainsley. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Frischi. I'm a, a plant ecologist, agronomist, and native plant materials specialist with the Xerxes Society, which is a, a nonprofit conservation organization focused on invertebrate conservation. And uh, all these insects are closely tied to plant communities. So Currently, I, I work on several projects that are connected. Um, some are with natural areas and some are in agro ecosystems and getting more native plants uh, and functional diversity back in those landscapes. I work with farmers in Canada, across the United States, um, in Mexico and Peru. And then as Kingsley alluded to, I also was involved in a research project and learning network in Europe um, working with a native seed company in Spain and kind of developing priority species that can be used as understory native cover crops in, in olive orchards. Um, and, and I think I really learned the, the ropes as a restoration practitioner in the tall grass prairie ecoregion of the, the Midwest of the United States. And, and there I led our wild seed collection and our seed mix design and our, our planting. And that was in conjunction with a seed production nursery at the same site. And in any given year, uh, we would plant seed mixes with about 400 different species in them and covering around 800 acres. And so we were generating all of that seed in-house, we weren't purchasing it. And um, we, we did calculate on a, a PLS basis to determine our, our seed mixes and things. But that's maybe another uh, a question for you, Simone. I think your cost analysis is really interesting, especially for these um, post mining sites and a lot of these Australian species that that combination of site conditions and climate and the the big dormancy issues with these species that yeah really focusing on all these different pinch points along the the seed supply chain is important and I, I just wonder if you could speak to how that might translate to other parts of the world or other systems or if you'd be, if you'd consider doing a, a similar cost analysis um, for, for places where maybe the environment isn't such a, a barrier to successful establishment. Yeah, I mean, this was just an example, an example that we developed because it was here and we have all this background information on those pieces and I've been working on them for more than a year, but the framework that like I've developed to build this simulation can actually be applied anywhere else because those variables that I use to run the simulation can be changed and modified according to the different scenarios. So if you know, for example, that in your place, you don't have some of the issues we've got here in terms of pseudomacy, that will eventually affect the cost and the treatment needed or success rate tends to be higher or recruitment of species coming from outside, maybe makes it less needed to get some species in your mix. Those are all variables that can be accounted for when running your simulation. I'm still thinking about this approach. I was maybe try to, I don't know, maybe publish or make it available like the entire table to run this calculation. So a practitioner can use this tool and try to run scenarios himself. And as the more data he collects, the more precise the simulation is gonna be. So if you understand the germination rates, if you understand the dormancy treatment, if you understand all of these variables, that makes your simulation more precise. And you can be more precise when you try to develop your seeding and plan for your seeding. So ideally, yes, you could potentially apply it everywhere, but it's more like how many data you're feeding to the simulation that means more precise your outcome is going to be. I don't know if they answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, it um, presents um, the interesting challenge of internationalizing these models, um, Simon, um, and, and uh, potentially getting work, a workbook, international workbook going might be the way where we work with different regions to run the models. Yep. Is that going to be feasible? Uh, I don't know, it depends if people pick it up and want to run it, 
yes, it's. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to try it, Stephanie? <laughs> Unless someone in Europe, if they want to try it. But yeah, ideally, yeah. yes, because the, the, the more, as I said, more data you get, the better this, this model becomes, the more yeah. reliable. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it may be interesting now that you've got the, the model of the whole seed supply chain um, with uh, essentially the formulas along that model mm -hmm. um, to input what available information there is. And if there's yeah. no information, that's, uh, that's fine. Or guesstimates, that would, that yeah. would be good as well. So uh, that, that could be a really great task of the International Network for Seed-Based Restoration. To, to try and get some of these workbooks operating in in different biomes, um, in different biodiverse regions. Um, and, and Stephanie, you know, you do make the good point, you know, this is an Australian model, but I guess the Australian model is uh, on a scale of easy to difficult in the seed supply chain. We're probably right up the difficult end. So you're really seeing some of the worst, uh, <laughs> some of the worst problems you might hit with that supply chain. And, and when you spoke of 400, or, or sorry, how many species? 400? Yeah, yeah. 400. Oh, and they're mostly herbaceous, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And our, our, many of our systems, and I know my colleagues in Africa, they're non-herbaceous, they're woody shrubs. And so the dream of getting 200 species would be amazing. So yeah, it'd be good to run the model on the many hundreds of species. Um, Nancy, from your experiences, you mentioned fire, and I just wanted to focus on that for just a moment because I know some of the participants have, have a particular interest in fire. As you all know, in Australia, we had the terrible black summer fires of 2019, 2020. Um, you know, three billion animals um, died, um, and um, the the consequences were an outpouring of public grief and the need to go out and restore. And what we were trying to do is saying well, these systems can also rebound. Um, so I'm interested in your comment about reburning of habitats causing declines in seed banks. So that is known, and therefore your remediation actions are based on real knowledge of a lack of resilience from the soil seed bank. Is that correct? And therefore you do... Do you do fill the gaps? Um, yes, it's we have to look at every every plant community type. Once you get into a little higher elevation where you have more precipitation, they're more likely to be able to come back on their own. Um, and even at lower elevation sites, um, if they haven't burned for some time, there's that possibility too. So there, it really is important to focus on whether or not seeding is actually required, but things like our dominant sagebrush does not recover after burning and um, its seeds are not long lived. So there are there are real problems with some of our vegetation. Yep. Due to these new fire regimes. Yep, yeah, thank you. Um, Alexis, um, I'm unable to see the questions that the uh, attendees are putting up. Um, are you able to uh, provide those. Yep, happy happy to do so. So the I do apologise to the attendees, but as panelists, it's not easy to see all the the questions. Yeah. There's a few about the the pelleting of the seeds, and the first one is: Does pelleting help reduce predation of seeds? Uh, yes. So there's a few studies done in agriculture. One very nice example in Brazil, uh, they've tested, uh, they're doing coating with some pesticide and they didn't want the seeds to be predated by wild birds because it might kill them. So they tried to coat them in different colors, blue and red. And it turns out that blue is the most effective to reduce predation from birds. Uh, so that's something to think about and consider. Uh, another example, like there's a few studies done uh, in, um, in the Northwest in, uh, in Utah and Oregon, that actually shows that pelleting on um, native seeds using capsaicin help reducing predation 
because it's something that rodents really don't want to eat. It's too spicy. But activated carbon also proved to be effective and it's probably easier to handle than capsaicin and less dangerous to work with. So there are various things that even without using like chemical compounds can reduce the predation, for example, from rodents or birds. And um, for, for everyone, of course, the, the global agricultural and horticultural seed palleting industry regularly use um, anti-grazing or anti-predation uh, um, compounds, usually chemically based, um, and fungicide materials. So they're, they're really all that you get with most commercial palleting in the horticultural and agricultural field. So that's well known. I think uh, the space that a number of us are working on in the US and here in Australia is uh, turning pellets into very smart seeds. So putting very much more interesting, naturally occurring plant chemistry, um, such as everything from salicylic acid uh, to overcome stress, uh, drought, and uh, cool, freezing stress, all the way through to growth promoters such as smoke and the smoke chemical. Alexis, next question. Right. The next question is, are there any long-term impacts of the seed treatments you are using? Do they have any lasting presence in the soil? Oh, well, the honest answer would be, I don't know, because we've just started doing it. So eventually we'll need to evaluate it. The material I'm using, uh, for example, the polymers in the mix are all water soluble. So ideally they'll just dissolve completely and there wouldn't be much trace of that in the environment. If there is some, some compounds, they'll stay in the soil for longer. That's, that could be an issue. I also can see that uh, the advantage of using seed coating, if you, for example, need to deliver some insect control, um, since it's coating, it means that instead of spraying all the entire field, you just need to put it around the seeds, and that can drop up to 1% the amount of, material, of uh, compounds that you need to use. So if you need to use chemical, because you do it directly on the seed, it, it really saves the amount of material you use, and it's got environmental benefit that you're not spreading as much through the environment. But really, like the long-term effect, that's, I mean, takes long-term study to really be able to that. I guess, Simon, um, if we look at uh, the impacts, the percentage of the soil volume, and these are benign uh, minor polymers, it's um, beyond uh, <laughs> minuscule uh, impacts and potentially microbial decay would be very rapid. Having said that, you have also tested plant-based polymers. Um, um, and that's potentially um, a space that uh, we might move into more so into the future. Alexis, thank you. All right. Uh, this is from Holly and she says, thank you for this detailed presentation, especially at such an early hour of the morning in Perth. <laughs> How do you seed pre-germinated or processed seed? Do you require extra logistics to deliver this treated seed? Or is this seed just used to germinate nursery plants in controlled conditions? Um, not sure I've understood the question. Like pre-germinated pre seed, we seed like once if they start to germinate, they, it's, it's, yeah, it's a plant. Oh, no, I think they're talking. I think, uh, Simon, I think talking about priming. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. So priming no, I don't. Seed. Yeah, I don't think it alters the logistics because the seed remains the same physically. Um, what it's a di different if it's primed or even with pelleting, we might start to see some micro climbing effect because they're exposed to a moist environment for a few hours, is that this will speed up germination a bit, but it'll probably decrease a longevity in storage. So usually I'd recommend not to do pelleting years before you use the seeds. Just do it a few months before you, you're gonna put them out there because we are not yet sure what the effect is gonna be on the longevity in storage. I hope this answers the question. Kingsley, do you have something to add? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's it. Um, of course, if you've got seed that's moist in your seed storage, 
age and you're worried they're germinating, you need to get them out. Um, but that, of course, encourages you to develop more effective seed storage strategies. Stephanie and Nancy, anything to contribute on um, using primed and seed, or is this something that happens in, in your experiences? Nancy, you're muted. We haven't been using prime seed. There's been research, but we haven't been doing it at an applied scale. Yeah. yeah. Mm. All right. Um, so there's a few more questions coming in. The next one set is currently is pelleting technology cost effective for a small scale seed producer? Uh, I don't know. Read to run the numbers, see how much it will cost to establish um, the seed pelleting equipment needed to learn to do it because especially on the small seed species, it'll take a while to understand how it can be done. But on the long run, I think yes, because it seems like we are moving towards that direction. So it might be a big investment up front, but over time is probably gonna pay for itself because if it proves to be effective and to working well, then eventually the customer will ask more for it if there's a return for them as well. So if you wanna move ahead of the curve, I would say, yes, yeah, it's worth considering. But check it carefully, not to break the bank to try to do it and, and try yeah. to go too fast into There's it. All... But yeah, potentially yes, it'll be it'll be bigger. Yeah. Um, and and a note of caution. I remember when we um, first showed some of this technology, uh, one of our industry partners in the mining industry then welcomed us back and said, "Look, we've we've bought a seed coating machine and we've got the polymers and we've done all of this, but all we do is get a lot of gunk." these big aggregations of seed and it doesn't work it fails and that that points to the fact that um it's really an art form getting the technology to work but once you understand it and for even small seed producers i think you can have a great greatly value added product um, and particularly because you can do things such as add a blue color and suddenly overcome the bird predation which needs to be checked in each country so um, I think there's uh, enormous advantages. I'm reminded that many people um, have used cement mixes and just uh, lime to roughly coat seeds, uh, native seeds. It's, it's been done on a very small basis, and that's very crude indeed. But um, I think there's opportunities for potentially the INSR coming up with a series of uh, webinars and training videos of how to develop your own small scale seed pelleting since um, you've spent, Simon, I guess, six years trying to unravel the commercial incompetence uh, technologies of the, the big agricultural seed companies. And, and now that's publicly available information. Alexis, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this is from Melissa, she says, uh, we run into this entrenched sentiment that native seeds can't be standardized, yet the forestry sector has achieved significant gains. Do you think okay. it will just take another five to 10 years of data to convince the laggards? <laughs> Melissa, I felt like I needed I to say your to name the... since you used uh, such a specific language. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll open that up to the whole panel because this goes to the core of the, the issue. Nancy. Uh, I think we want to maintain as much genetic variability as we possibly can in our native populations. Um, Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, I think the forestry sector in some ways is, is similar. They're, those are, are um, not agronomic species in, in seeds. So some of the issues are similar to these wild native species. But um, I think also we need to be cautious with how much we try to standardize things because like Nancy said, you want to maintain the genetic representativeness of the source populations that will help um, assure there's the, the most resilience for future conditions in those restored areas. And again, you know, forestry is really an economic activity. So there's been some different drivers 
um, towards that efficiency and those economies of scale and standardization um, in the forestry industry. And I think we need those solutions in seed-based ecological restoration, but, but we may take some different paths um, to get there. So um, Alexis, given the time and the fact that we get auto cut off by um, the platform, um, uh, unless there's any uh, burning issues coming up in the chat, um, I might just do the wrap up. I think that would be great. Okay, yeah. Look, thanks everybody. Thanks so much, uh, Simon, Stephanie and Nancy. Um, uh, and thanks to the, the participants. I think what we're seeing is uh, uh, the decade of ecosystem restoration, the UN decade, presents extraordinary opportunities. Um, I know globally the seed supply chain represents one of the great confounders. Uh, in many places in the world, um, we generally run to simplistic plantings um, simply because we can't get the diversity. I think what we're doing with the International Network for Seed-Based Restoration is encouraging people to broaden that base and to make it the many hundreds of species. This is, as it's been written recently in Nature, this is potentially the last shot. This is essentially our moonshot to, to rescue the planet and bring it back and to provide habitat through what we do in restoring planetary ecosystems and landscapes. This is a great opportunity and starting with seed and diverse seed and understanding how to optimize that so we can get the scale is absolutely critical. And very much today and, and thanks so much to Simon um, and for the very early morning presentation. I think it's opened our eyes to the realities that we can get robust opportunities. We can strengthen the seed supply chain and that we should go forward and engage and begin this uh, international seed dialogue so that in 10 years time, we will be talking about fantastic landscapes of biodiverse ecosystems with their plants and their animals in, in full equilibrium. That's the vision and uh, let's go forward. So thank you all for participating. Thank you so much, Alexis, for the complexities in setting this up. Uh, I think this is just a wonderful way that we can all time travel to other parts of the world and all see and hear each other. And we look forward to the participants on this and those that will listen to this recording afterwards to hear from you in the INSR family and just go into the SER website to find out how to get to us or check us up um, by Googling um, International Network for Seed-Based Restoration and we will welcome you aboard. So thank you all. Have a good afternoon and a good morning, and for some of you, a good night. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>